Hello everyone and welcome to the latest Pro Soccer Talk. I'm your host Joe Prince right over here in England. Delighted to say, as always, I'm joined by Nick Mandola in Buffalo, New York and Andy Edwards in Kansas City. Gents, summertime version of Pro Soccer Talk. A little bit of a break, but doesn't mean there's not a lot going on in the soccer world. Transfer news, you've had the 2026 World Cup host city announcement in North America. Uh, international break as well. So we've got a lot to catch up on today. But firstly, Nick, how are things <laughs> in New York, mate? Yeah, we uh, it's great. We got that the hot weather is officially here. It, it seems right. like in uh, if you live in one of these midwestern cities that get all four seasons, the first time it gets really hot, kind of is like a punch in the face, and you're like, "Whoa, this is happening now." So I think we've weathered that, and we're just into the beautiful, uh, just feeling good about the heat. Wow. Yeah. I mean, here it gets to like 80 degrees and everyone is freaking out. There's no air conditioning really a lot. So you'll see a lot on Twitter, probably English people complained about the weather here because we had a, a mini heat wave, which was about 85. So Andy, I know that's nothing for you in Kansas City, right? You probably have <laughs> most days now. No, Nick, what's the humidity situation in Buffalo? Because here for the last week, it's like 90% humidity, 90 degrees outside. That that disgusting sauna that you walk outside and yeah. you just feel your entire body immediately just yeah. get wet on the surface. It's disgusting. <laughs> you know, it, it hasn't been great, but the the kind of the kind of cool thing is, I don't know uh, if you guys ever heard of cottonwood, but uh, we've actually been so these little pieces of cotton that just kind of float through the air. So it kind of like either it looks like it's still snowing in Buffalo, which it certainly isn't, or it looks like the upside down in uh, in Stranger Things, where there's just a, something is amiss. So that's the one thing that's been weird this summer. Okay, so if you're just tuning in, welcome to Pro Weather Talk. It has replaced Pro Weather <laughs> Talk. Um, but everyone, thanks so much again for joining us. And gents, let's get on to the first big topic here because we have a lot to catch up on uh, after the last few weeks. So first big topic today on Pro Soccer Talk, analyzing the 2022-23 Premier League fixtures. It's out, gents. The schedule, 380 games, has been released since the last time we spoke. And what stands out to us? I mean, because usually, Nick, I feel like one or two teams can feel either very happy or a little hard done by, by the schedule. And it's weird, right? Because you play all the same other 19 teams home and away uh, during the season. But the way it shakes out, be it a tough start, a tough finish, maybe a rough festive period. And this year, especially with the World Cup, which we'll talk about a lot, um, a lot more eyes on the schedule to see how teams kind of stack up throughout the season. But any initial takeaways for you or maybe teams that uh, maybe uh, – we're on Dubai or maybe games that you're already looking forward to, even though we're still in the middle of the summer. Yeah. So the thing that I found most interesting as I analyzed the sort of big boys, as we like to talk about them, is that Man United has uh, an interesting situation, right? So it's going to be new players, a new coach, a new system, and the chance to overanalyze everything that happens. And then you look at August 20th and September 3rd, Liverpool and Arsenal both come to Old Trafford. And while the, the situation should be, it's going to take some time, it's going to take some time. Imagine they get a result from Liverpool that early in the season and then, you know, build it up with a win against Man United or against Arsenal. Excuse me. I, I just it's going to be interesting to see how much time Eric Ten Hag actually gets with two big games that early in the season. Yeah, that's really intriguing to look at that. And talking about big games and big teams, Andy, you look at the two title favourites, as things stand, Liverpool and Man City. Look at their starts. I mean, Liverpool got Man United early in the season, as Nick mentioned there. But Man City got a pretty easy start to the campaign when you look at their first five fixtures there. But how are we thinking about this? Because this is a weird season, right? It starts a lot earlier than usual because of the World Cup. Players might not have as much rest. I'm, I'm just it's difficult to, to kind of throw it up if, if there's an advantage for having bigger games earlier in the season right or, or having a slightly easier run on paper so yeah. what's your takeaway on the, the Giants up there yeah and very quickly on Manchester United I don't think patience is going to be something that's given to them for those early season big you know the rivalry games early on and uh, you know, Nick is trying to take the rosy side there, I guess, and say, well, what if they pull off a win against Liverpool early in the season? What if they lose 3-0 to Liverpool four games into the season? And it just it very quickly starts to look like another season of this for Manchester United. I, I, that seems a little bit more likely to me at this point. So that is a very difficult start for them. I, I would prefer to have an easier start for you know, either of Liverpool or Manchester City if I was a fan of those teams. Because if you look at, uh, they're in not in transition quite. 
but they are certainly both probably going to be tactically different this season because of what they've done in the transfer market thus far, bringing in Erling Holland and bringing in Darwin Nunez, they are going to have to change some things. And so you want to be able to have, I think, a few games early on in the season where not easy games, but games that you're expected to win, games that you know you're going to have a ton of possession, games that you can really work on things in, in a live situation. You can train it all day, and we know how meticulous Pep and Klopp both are uh, on the training field, but it doesn't compare until you get out there against another team that is set up to stop you, that has been working on you all week, um, and, and then you really have to show uh, that evolution of what these teams are going to be. And I think that's probably, uh, with regards to the schedule and the transfers that have happened already, that's the most exciting. <laughs> exciting thing to me is we have Liverpool and Manchester City so established in this Premier League over the last after the last three or four years now that they've been battling head to head but now they're going to be just a little bit different and I, I, I just find that interesting because the inertia that can creep in I think is is honestly the downfall of a lot of really really great teams and so I think Klopp and Pep are both smart enough to know that it can't stay the same forever the personnel is going to change the tax are, tactics are going to have to change and so you just throw in one more fascinating wrinkle to again we've been saying it two of the all-time greats in the Premier League uh you know uh, the se the season's not far away uh, but it can't get here soon enough now. It really isn't. Less than 50 days now, the countdown is on, would you believe? So really looking forward to this. I think Arsenal and Chelsea fans will be really looking forward to the start of the season. If you look at their first five, Arsenal have Palace, Leicester, Bournemouth, Fulham and Villa, and Chelsea have Everton, Spurs, Leeds, Leicester and Saints. And I think there's an opportunity there for both those London clubs to really get off to a flying start, uh, especially with... I think we're going to see a lot of changes at both teams in terms of the players and the personnel. Arsenal are trying to make moves and now Chelsea with some of their uh, backroom staff being sorted out. It seems like they're uh, going to be bringing in some new attacking players as well, which is really exciting with Lukaku moving on and, you know, Thomas Ducal getting a bit more help there uh, in the final third uh, or maybe players that suit that system slightly better. But in terms of teams that struggle, I do feel sorry for poor old Bournemouth, the newly promoted team. I mean, they play... At home against Villa on the opening day, away at Man City, home against Arsenal, away against Liverpool, and then home against Wolves. I mean, that is, talk about welcome back to the Premier League. That is a tough start. And yeah, some of the other newly promoted teams as well, Fulham have got Liverpool and Arsenal uh, in their first five games as well. So it's cliche, but we all know how important a good start is, right? It can set the tone for a season. There are teams that have great starts and then fall off. i um, not going to mention some of them that are close to my heart, but um, there, it is quite, I think, important, especially for mid to lower table teams to get a good run of fixtures at the start of the season, hit the ground running, get the points on the board, and just take some of the pressure off. But, but Nick, when we're looking at um, some of those teams who you think might start well, is there anybody else there that could have an opportunity to, to really come flying out of the traps early in the season and maybe cause a few surprises? Because Nottingham Forest, there's a lot of good vibes around them, right, after their promotion. And if they can make some of these sign-ins in the, in the window, it's not a terrible start for them. It isn't. And I, I, the other thing I, I've been looking at is a team that has a chance to get a win kind of early and then build it back with maybe a surprise here. A little bit of playing with house money, if you will, right? So it, Palace, I know that there, there are some expectations there, um, but th they're brutal start, right? At the same time, are they at a point where there's enough confidence in the process? There's enough confidence in what they are building that fans are just kind of hoping for some glimpses. The flip side of that, as you mentioned, Nottingham Forest, right? Going to a Newcastle team that I think a lot of us are expecting to be fairly changed. Uh, and then and then having a West Ham after that, going to Nottingham Forest, it's gonna be in a in a in a buzz especially after maybe getting a result at Newcastle. So these are all exciting things to me. The one thing um, is a kind of a wild card. I don't know that we, we plan for this part of it, but I do love Joe, when you mentioned being early in the season um, or the season starting as early as it is, I thought, doesn't this make the community shield with Man City and Liverpool a little bit more tasty for us, but also a little bit more beneficial for them, for Holland and Nunez to get a taste before they go into their games. And maybe that's bad news for Fulham and West Ham uh, on week one. Oh, yeah. See Haaland feasting on some of those early games, right? It probably have 15 goals after those first five <laughs> games. Um, yeah, really, really good point there. Of course, the, the community shield will be at the King Power Stadium as well this season uh, oh. with Wembley hosting mm -hmm. other games. So 
And another interesting thing to look out in this very unique season coming up. We talk about that, lads. Uh, Andy, the World Cup, obviously, the Premier League is going to take a break from after the weekend of Saturday, November 12th, and then won't return until uh, December 26th, Boxing Day, of course. There'll be an extravaganza and a relaunch of sorts of the season. Uh, looking at some of the fixtures that teams have just before the World Cup and then just after the World Cup, do you think that benefits maybe some of the smaller Premier League teams who don't have as many players go into the World Cup? And they almost have a month's break, right, to work on tactics and really uh, get well drilled. And then the likes of Man City, Liverpool, Chelsea and others are going to lose a lot of their players for a long time and they may be absolutely yeah. shattered by the time they come back. So that's something to keep an eye on, right, in the middle of the season. Yeah, I think a real thing to keep an eye on with the World Cup is actually going to be, and and I don't think anybody's going to come out and say it uh, publicly, but I think we're going to see it as some players maybe taking a game or two or a couple weeks, not off, but you know, ratcheting down the in intensity a little bit before the World Cup, because with this being in the middle of the season, I can see a lot of players saying, look, I don't want to get injured right before the World Cup. This is a, such a unique opportunity for every player in the world, especially players that have never been in the World Cup, uh, players that are, that are from some of the smaller nations that don't always qualify. Uh, that importance is just a little bit different than their club career, which runs every single year. And so I just, I, I, I will be very curious to see um, if there are some managers as well who are going to have to manage those players differently. You know, you talk about just uh, the intensity of the Premier League and, and what it is week in and week out, and then you throw in the the World Cup right in the middle with only a week before. So there's no time to really build up slowly to it. It's going to go in, you know, full speed and everything. So I, I think that might actually be the interesting thing is we might lose some of the, the bigger stars for a game or two right before the break for the World Cup because players are going to want to be fresh. They're not going to want to be hurt. Um, and uh, the the teams at the bottom of the table, the, the, the teams that are not going to have uh, as many players going to the World Cup, like you say, Joe, big, big advantage at that point. So I, I don't think it's going to be so impossible to predict anything that's going to happen this season because of how many unique factors, you know, we, we're looking ahead and trying to think, okay, this is going to be the big one. There's three or four other big things, uh, you know, different hurdles that teams are going to have to clear this season that have never existed before that we're not even prepared for at this point. Well, of course, as well, it's the season starts early and then there's not an international break until the end of September, where usually there's one in early September and that's the only one. So teams are going to be going flat out, Champions League, Europa League, cup competitions all wedged in to a crazy, what, four and a half month period. And then talk about the World Cup and how massive that is for so many of these players in the Premier League. So, yeah, great point there, because I think a lot of managers, even they want to play their star players uh, in every single game. I think they're going to be thinking, you know, in the case of Pep, um, should I rest Kevin De Bruyne for a couple of weeks for the World Cup? And then he'll come back, hopefully fresh, and there won't be risk of an injury. So, yeah, a lot to unfold and, and unwrap between now and when the Premier League season starts. But head over to Pro Soccer Talk and NBCSports.com and you can see the latest full schedule for all 380 games this season. Gents, I can barely wait. The countdown is on already. And uh, it's going to be, as we said, a very unique season in the Premier League. Let's move on now to our next big topic on Pro Soccer Talk this week, and that is transfer news. Obviously, Darwin Nunez to Liverpool. That's been completed. Club record deal. Well over $100 million all in. I mean, it, we've seen what he's done at Benfica, right, over the last few seasons. Sensational, especially last season in the Champions League. Nick, how does he slot in and, and how will Liverpool's sort of tactics develop or change? Because, um, you know... I think, pardon the pun, but there's a theory of evolution here with Liverpool when it comes to Darwin uh, coming in. I think it's going to have to be. Uh, <laughs> took Sorry, me a minute. Very, very took me a minute. <laughs> uh, yeah, slow on the uptake. We're just getting back into the flow. I'm a little bit concerned. Um, I think he's going to be a success over time. Don't get me wrong. I have no, not no question, but very little question about that. Um, and Mane leaving is one thing, but... Yes, we're a year removed from Roberto Firmino being a key piece of what they do, but he was such a linker, right? He allowed Mane and Salah in a way that some center forwards don't to really carry the attack at times and to really worry about getting their best shots off. And Nunez is different. Uh, Nunez is different. Not to say that Jurgen Klopp can't evolve him. I guess this goes a little bit to what Andy discussed about Erling Holland maybe taking a little bit of time to adjust to Man City. Um, I think this is that maybe on steroids. Nunez may get his goals, and yet Liverpool may not still be as 
as feisty, <laughs> if you will, uh, especially as we're going into the final year of Mohammed Salah, which and that looks like I think that's what's going to happen, that he's going to ride out his contract. And if that happens, this guy wants to shoot. This guy wants the ball. And I'm a little bit nervous if you look at the underlying numbers of Darwin Nunez. This is not Firmino is an elite enabler and he is mm -hmm. very unselfish for a center forward. Darwin Nunez may very well be that as well, but we don't know that yet. Andy, what kind of what type of player Liverpool get in there? Because Nick alluded to it. He's, he's different than the other Liverpool forwards mm -hmm. and the other forwards they've kind of recruited because even uh, Luis Diaz coming in and Diogo Jota fit the Liverpool mould, right? So yeah. for, for Nunez coming in, I mean, where will he slot in? Is, do we think up top centrally for Benfica? That's where he played. But he kind of likes to the ghost off to the left flank and just run the channels as well. So maybe he could fit into that more fluid Liverpool attack, right? Yeah, I, I think all players these days are are, are talented enough, obviously, and, and have an understanding enough to play in multiple positions, especially up top. Uh, but the phrase that I always come back to is uh, he will be a player that they play to and not through and in the way that they played through mm -hmm. Firmino to mm -hmm. get to someone else to create the chances or, or for Firmino as well uh, with the ball coming back to him. I think, and, and Nick bring, brings up a great point there about Firmino being an enabler for all of the chances that he missed and, and should have put away over the years. I think those things stick in people's minds, obviously a lot more. And so I, I think the image of Firmino uh, in a lot of people's minds is not quite uh, doesn't quite match up to what actually the importance of him on the field for that Liverpool team and the importance that he carried in Klopp's mind as well. Because when you have Mane and Salah, who are essentially kind of secondary forwards playing out wide, you want to create as many chances as you possibly can for them because they've got the speed, they've got the movement, they've got the intelligence to get into those spaces. And so you just want somebody to get them the ball with Mane going, with Salah getting older, and maybe it's his final season, and it's transitioning to Luis Diaz and Diogo Jota, it's going to be a lot different the way that the, the the front three, the front four, front five, however many they end up with when the season starts, that how they operate. And so I think that's going to be really interesting. And we also have to remember, every time there is a young uh, upcoming star, already established superstar that goes through a big transfer, these nine figure transfer fees, it never happens immediately. We have to remember that it always takes time. And the one thing I'll disagree with, with, with what Nick said is if he is only contributing goals, if he is only putting the ball in the back of the net, I don't think he'll play because that's not going to fit uh, what Klopp wants defensively and, and, and all the other aspects of the game because it is such a fluid situation there with Liverpool. So uh, I do think he's got uh, you know, the it's, it's going to be difficult for him to come into that team that's already so well established and has a way of playing. Everybody else has to change and he has to meet them somewhere in the middle. That's just a really complicated situation for somebody who's 22 years old and only a couple of years of experience at that really, really high level. But he was really good. I mean, Liverpool still first oh, yeah. and uh, with Benfica Klopp, if you look back at the presses now where he's asked to talk about Nunez, he scored in both legs against Liverpool in the Champions League knockout stage this season. He's talking about how aggressive he is, how direct he is, how he loves his power, his speed. Um, I mean, I can see him Liverpool actually changing tactically. I think he's that good for them to maybe change their tactics slightly. I mean, just looking back at Klopp's former teams, at, he's always kind of in 4-3-3 at Liverpool, right? But at Dortmund, when he had Lewandowski, he was kind of a similar hold-up centre-forward. They did play a 4-2-3-1. And I feel like Liverpool, maybe this is a way, right, to evolve uh from losing Mane to Bayern potentially losing Salah as well and say okay this is a perfect chance for us now to to spread around and maybe develop our game in a different way so we're not just plugging players in to try and replace Salah and Mane and the goals and assists that they had because that's going to be very very difficult to replace so I don't know if it will take teams by surprise but it certainly will be I think a bit different right Nick tactically for Liverpool which could help with those big name players going out the door it will uh let me i kind of want to piggyback a little bit on what andy was saying i actually i think he will be a big part of what they do 
not box to box, but this guy has work rate. This guy will defend. He will track back. He'll be a great presser of the ball. He's going to get a couple goals next year where either the goalie is forced to make a, a bad decision because of the intense pressure. He's very good. And I think aerially, that's the one thing. We may see a little bit more feasting from Alexander Arnold and, and, and Trent, or excuse me, and Andy Robertson or Costa Simicas with the, with the big crosses because he is a, a, a force in the air. My only my worry when I talk about him, if he can just score some goals to get started, is because I don't I don't know that we'll see what's your enduring image of Roberto Firmino. This is the funny part for me. Besides some of the big late goals he scored, is Salah plays it inside and it's a no look back heel pass back inside the eighteen is an entry to Mane. Like that's how I visualize him, and that's where I think it's going to take Nunez some time to adapt. Yeah, and you know what? Like usually, you can tell within the first couple of games or even the first couple of training sessions how it's going to click between these players. It's strange. Some partnerships yeah. develop over time, right? Yeah. But you you have to think that Liverpool have seen him up close, played against him, scouted him extensively, and can see that he's going to be able to link up with Luis Diaz or if Salah stays around. Um, then there's going to be a good combination there. But but Andy, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on him, not just the yeah. price tag, but with Mane going out, he's been. An absolute legend for Liverpool, won trophies, scored goals galore, so reliable. I mean, how much pressure is there on Nunez and Luis Diaz? Because as good as Diaz was for Liverpool when he came in in January, there was a little dip at the end of the season, the FA Cup final, Champions League final, where maybe the pressure, and he's still young as well, but maybe just got a little bit too much for him. So there's a lot of pressure on those two young guys who ripped it up in Portugal and their talent is undoubted, but moving to Liverpool to replace Salah and Mane potentially is a whole new ball game. Yeah, that, that's the difference between reaching the top and then staying at the top as a club when you have to then, you know, bring in the next group, build the next team. And, and that's going to be very interesting to see how Klopp handles that entire process, because it took three or four years. If you remember back, what, 2016 he was hired or 2015, one of the two, uh, it took three or four years to really get things right, to get the players in that he wanted to get his ideas to start to go to come through the players on the field. And so uh, it, it might not be right out of the gate this season because that is a lot of change for a team that we have come to expect such an incredibly almost impossibly high standard from Liverpool over these last few years so I think give them a little bit give everybody a little bit of leeway uh, at the start of the season this year because of the short off season and everything preseasons are going to be short transfers I think there's going to be a lot of business done between now and the start of the season and the final point or it's a question really to you guys do you think Klopp will continue to complain about how much money that Manchester City spent <laughs> after doing this deal for Nunez? And and I'm just thinking all the money spent on Nabi Keita. I mean, there have been some oh. big fees that Liverpool have spent over the years. And for him to take the high horse of, well, if we had endless money, we could do that too. Well, they kind of do. Uh, well, it's all about net spend, right? It's net spend. No, the, yeah, the net spend kings, right? They are yeah. mid table, and Man City are way ahead at the top. So I'm just, I'm just going to chuck that out. Well, there. so here's the thing: I, Liverpool has done an incredible job, and this is not going where any of you think it is, at inflating the fees of the guys they sell. Right? Like I saw the other day. Not that Nico Williams won't be great, but it was like a 17 million pound number attached to him, and I was like, really? Because you're coming from Liverpool when you're coming from a system where people trust. That, that Jurgen Klopp has used these people. Um, you know, Man City last year got a boatload of money for Ferran Torres. So so mm -hmm. I I do agree. I'm at the point where my hope is that maybe this is the year that Jurgen Klopp chills with the complaints, period. But <laughs> he cannot do the money thing. He just can't yeah. anymore. Um, I mean, yeah. They're in the top 10 for spending. I mean, yeah. that's that's a thing. But, you know, if they move on, obviously Mane is going for a decent fee to Bayern, Minamino, maybe Oxlade Chamberlain, maybe some other fringe players, and you bring in Nunez and maybe another player. It's, it's still pretty good business, I think. It's oh, a yeah. very well run club. And now, with some of the other changes from the recruitment department, it'd be intriguing to see if they can keep that going, right? And obviously, Jurgen Klopp mm -hmm. has uh, signed a new contract recently, so he thinks they can. Final point, Nick, before we move no, on. No, I was just going to say it's that it, the, the, it's not an issue with them spending the money, it's him complaining about it. Everybody spends, and he just acts like they don't. <laughs> That's fair enough. That's a good <laughs> point. Um, all right. So any any more transfer news for Liverpool around the Premier League? We'll keep you updated on Pro Soccer Talk all summer long. And uh, really intriguing tactically to see how Darwin Nunez, the new club record signer for Liverpool, slots in up front. He's got some big shoes to fill, especially with Sadio Mane. But I feel like it's going to be a very different Liverpool attack this season. So I'm really excited to watch that play out at Anfield. 
Okay, gents, next big topic, transfer news-wise. What is going on at Manchester United? Um, a slow <laughs> summer so far. I feel like this is a time what we could have been asking this of any of the last oh. four summers. But Eric Ten Hag's come in, but no new players have followed him yet. Um, I can't work out if this is a good or a bad thing. If Man United, the lack of new players coming in means they are developing plans and they have a proper recruitment strategy now, or if it's just more of the same. I mean... United's fans are very frustrated. We can see that when Nunez coming in at Liverpool for big money, Man City bringing in Erling Haaland, and then not much going on at Old Trafford. I mean, we saw Richard Arnold, the CEO, being filmed uh, when he was having a few beers with some angry fans who were due to protest. He took him down the pub, had a pint. They did some secret filming of him uh, discussing, you know, saying that we spent loads of money and the money's there, but we need to get a proper person and recruitment policy in place to spend this money wisely with Eric Ten Hag and and a managing director. I feel like we've been here so many times uh, with Manchester United, but but Andy, I'm going to start with you because it seems to me, at least, like a lot of players have put off going to United. Whether or not it's one of the biggest clubs in the world, whether or not they've got one of the most talented up-and-coming managers in the world now, because even Frankie de Jong, who's worked with Eric Ten Hag closely, doesn't seem like he wants to go there. I mean, he's been asked, you know, the, one of the biggest teams in the world wants you, and he said, I'm already at the biggest club in the world, Barcelona. Doesn't seem bothered about going there. And then you hear about Christian Eriksen maybe being a bit put off. Timber as well from Ajax. Louis van Gaal telling them not to go there. I mean, does anybody want to sign for Man United? And can you understand this kind of situation? And do you actually think it makes sense to, to take their time? Or are they just doing the same old thing? Yeah, other than you know they're going to pay a ton of money uh, in wages. I, I don't know what the pull is to go to Manchester United right now because of the uncertainty with the squad, the manager, the system that they're going to play. What is the season going to look like? Can they be really competitive this season? They don't have Champions League to offer uh, this season. It might be a pretty uphill climb to get into it for next season as well. So there's just there's a lot of factors going against Manchester United right now, and, and it does feel like they almost need to take two or three giant steps back in terms of deconstructing what is some of the squad that they have now, uh, trying to get as much value as they can for a number of players. I think Jesse Lingard would have been a perfect example of that over the last six or 12 or 18 or 24 months that they just let his contract run down. He leaves for free and he's going to go on and be probably a very productive player in the Premier League elsewhere, probably at West Ham. And they got absolutely nothing for him. So I think the business that's been done, uh, whether incoming, whether outgoing, uh, whether mm. players contracts stagnating and expiring, it has just been bad over the last number of years. Uh, and, and so I don't know what the pull for a player would be. Uh, and, and the one thing that you're saying there, as you're talking about the things that Richard Arnold was saying, my first thought was, oh, that's great. They understand where they've gone wrong in the past, and they are maybe trying to be accountable. And then I thought, well, this is Manchester United, so there's always one more layer of just mess that is involved. And the thought came to my head, what if it was a plant? What if that was scripted to be put out there to, for the good publicity uh, of Manchester At this point, you... Probably not. But at this point, you can't completely write it off and say, oh, that's completely ridiculous. Manchester United would not do that because uh, it's just the way that the club has been run over a number of years. Uh, I think you could question absolutely anything that they do at Old Trafford. I mean, they are putting some of the building blocks in place, right? John Murtagh's coming in. Obviously, Fletcher's involved behind the scenes. And you have Eric Ten Hag is asking for certain players. If the reports are true, he's asked specifically for Frankie de Jong and Christian Eriksen. Whatever you think about those type of players and how they'd fit into this United squad already when you have Bruno Fernandes around, I have no idea how the, those players are all going to fit into a functioning team. But it seems like they're trying to get those building blocks in place. So like you said, let's give them the benefit of the doubt for this summer with a new manager, another new manager. But it seems like more's changed behind the scenes now with Edward without and different people coming in and trying to get that structure in place. But, but Nick, I mean... Andy mentioned there, there's a lot of players that have left. Pogba, Lingard, many others, Matic, Mata. Contracts have come to an end. Um, and Eric Ten Hag hasn't actually had an opportunity, right, to see these players yet up close and personal and training. So we still have to decide on this. Even with those players leaving, there's still a huge squad there of mostly international players. So do you think he's just taking his time to see who can actually rely on before they make big moves? Or it, what do you think about that? And what do you think his priority should be? in terms of signing players because there are some key areas where they really need to get a move on right oh for sure i i think there's a little bit of a deconstruction going on as you guys have mentioned but i also believe as i look at united and i look at the, the players that they have the um th there's enough there 
to get them through, um, you know, if, if they can deconstruct the click part of it, right? Remember we heard about that last year, that that was a big thing, that there were clicks in the room. Because I look at, mm -hmm. they have a world-class goalkeeper in David De Gea. Uh, mm -hmm. Rafael Varane is a fantastic center back who was not healthy for most of last year. Um, if they can find something in Harry Maguire to work through, then you start to look further up the field and you think, well, you know, Van de Beek is someone who is trusted mm -hmm. by Ten Hag and Bruno Fernandes and, oh, what, Jaden Sancho is now in his second year back in England and Marcus Rashford. So you start to see pieces here that, that can be absolutely functional together. And when we look at Manchester United, I'm not trying to be rosy here at all, um, but I, I really, really am not. What I'm thinking is they have to consider the PR aspect of absolutely everything. The first mm -hmm. signing of Ten Hag. Do they care about what order it is in? Um, you know, <laughs> Ahmad Diallo is, is, are they looking at some guys that he's told them, this is my guy and, and I'm really looking forward to this. I just don't have any idea how to judge them other than to know they're going to be very much judged. And I guess I'm just trying to guard against the hype because they're not going to be terrific. They're coming out of the gate. Um, Frankie de Jong, for the record, I do think would be almost perfect sort of building block to show these are the kind of players we are going to invest in. Um, you know, a possession-based player that we know fits our manager system. But I, I just the microscope right now has to be brutal there. Yeah, it does. And I, I think now that we understand Eric Ten Hag is clear philosophy, right? We know how they play to Ajax, interchanging midfielders, attackers, free-flowing football. With Ericsson and Frankie de Jong as the two main targets so far, you know that those are the kind of players that he's going to be recruiting. So then that's, mm. you look at the players that are there, right, Andy, and you look at Ronaldo. I mean, there's reports about him <laughs> maybe going elsewhere. And it's like, are guys like that really going to adapt their entire career and the way they've always played to play a totally different style of football at this stage of their career? And is there enough in that squad to play the way that Ten Hag wants to play? Because I don't think there is. I think this is going to take as we said, <laughs> years and there's going to be yeah. patience needed. And I don't think either the fans have it, probably the players there have it, and most yeah. of the people involved at Manchester United. You're asking some really, really expensive questions right there, <laughs> Joe. Uh, I mean, and, and they're all the right questions. It's all the right questions as well, yeah. because you have to consider these things. And I think uh, as you were uh, asking Nick uh, the previous question, I was thinking, I, I think we're asking the wrong questions about how Man United and Ten Hag are operating. If he's expected to come in and then run the rule over all the players and decide whether before or during preseason, I feel like they've failed him already. I, I feel like there should be whatever the transfer committee is, whatever the structure, whoever's on it, uh, should have a lot of that stuff to present to him on day one. And, and he should be familiar with, with the squad as well. Uh, but it feels like everything is moving a little slow for Manchester United so far in the start under Ten Hag. They got the, you know, they, they, they made the appointment before the season ended last season. We knew what was coming. And so we thought, okay, maybe they'll start a little bit quicker this summer. And they've just not. And as we're talking through all this, I'm thinking there's a lot of politics that goes on at Manchester United isn't there. And it's just really messy. There's politics in in the boardroom there's politics with the manager there's so many clicks and politics within the dressing room as well and some of the you know we've 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 named them already some of the star veterans that are there the young players trying to it's just man it's a really that's, bad situation at Manchester don't forget United. Sir Alex <laughs> that that's a lot to sort out and that's one of the reasons why Ronaldo you see him being linked away already and it's just you know where's that coming from and you know how would he <sighs> How much of an impact would it just be easier to move on from him? That's a discussion yes. for another yeah. day. And we've already kind of had that, right? And I think we all agree <laughs> it probably would be better yeah. for Eric Ten Hag to help bring in this new philosophy if he yeah. wasn't around. Other than the fact that it's Manchester United and it is, you know, the global brand that it is and the money that's attached to it, why would anyone want that job? Like, uh, if Unless you truly, deeply believe I am the one, I me can fix that and I will be, you know, I will be the next Sir Alex. Why would anyone want the job? Yeah, so, you know, the, the only thing working in Eric Ten Hag's favor, I think, is that he doesn't really seem phased by anything. I think he's quite, for lack of a better term, quite a boring kind of coach and a boring uh, persona, at least, uh, from the outside. His players love him. His tactics are great. The way he works, he's methodical. He's very, look at his career, the way he's built it up. So I think he has that working in his favor. I don't think the outside noise and maybe even some of the inside noise is going to... Um, hurt him that much or, or distract him 
Um, so maybe that will help in sorting out these clicks, right, and getting everybody unified behind the scenes. And if you don't agree with his style of football or him, his decisions, then I th I've got the feeling he's pretty ruthless from what we've seen in the past. Yeah. So let's wait and see. Let's wait and see. But Nick, final point to Man United before we move on to some other transfer news? Yeah, I think he has some hidden power here too because I look at what Antonio Conte, obviously different managers, but what he was able to do is this is a guy who when he spoke up, fans listened, the media listened. When he said something about how the club was operating, people said, well, this guy's one on the outside and they've trusted him to come in and he's a big name um, and they're not listening to him. I mean, yes, Ten Hag doesn't speak out a ton, but he is willing to. And mm -hmm. if he were to come out at any point and be like, they're not giving me what I need, that's it's, it's so more the same. Now, I think he realizes the value in not doing that as well. He has to help stabilize this club as well. But the mm. power that he has right now is probably higher at a club that size than most people get while going into a club that size because mm. they've been so messy for so long. Yeah, he's in a decent situation to, to have things turned around his way, but he's just got to buy this time. But I think there's been too much time wasted. As Andy mentioned, he came in early in the summer left his job at Ajax early to get the ball rolling. We don't know what he's been doing behind the scenes. Maybe he already knows exactly the players he wants in and out, and they're just trying to figure it out. But clock's ticking, Manchester United. Um, we look around some of the other big boys make, doing business. Andy, Tottenham Hotspur are flying. I mean, bringing in Perisic, obviously Basuma, Fraser Forster, some really good signings to strengthen the squad. I mean, how do you feel about Tottenham? And um, Arsenal and Chelsea and others in London are looking around and thinking, we wish we were making these kind of moves early in the summer. Yeah, uh, we can talk about the actual signings, who's been brought in, how they're going to fit at a later date. But the fact that Antonio Conte, Fabio Partici have essentially converted Daniel Levy um, and, and broken him down and said, this is how we're going to do business. We're going to do it early in the window. We're not going to leave it to deadline day, looking for the best possible deal and miss out on the players that I, the manager, Antonio Conte, truly want. I'm not going to stand for that in the way that previous managers did for years and years. Uh, and, you know, getting the deals done two weeks, three weeks into the window, knowing that most of the squad, if not all of it's going to be set for day one of preseason when Conte meticulously is ready to start drilling in his tactical plan for this team to not have the start in the first 10 games this season that they did last season. It just feels like everybody is finally pulling in the right in the same direction with the same idea um, and the people who who should be the ones kind of dictating how things are going to run are the ones doing that now yeah it's brilliant i mean uh, spurs fans is exactly what they wanted right when antonio conte came in what they hoped for obviously the early signs weren't great when he talked out against the club quite a lot and quite quite frequently uh, yeah but you there. know what i think that's why it's happening now the way that it is because he came in he applied pressure where it needed he looked at the club and said this club has potential a uh, very big club in london the stadium the training facilities the money that the, the commercial power that they now have and said this should be better. I'm going to make this better. And I think he has absolutely done that. I think putting the pressure on Levy publicly, where it maybe made some Spurs fans feel like he wasn't committed or he was just going to leave quickly if the first time that things got bad, I think he knew exactly what he was doing. I think we're seeing the the fruits of that now. Genius. Uh, Champions League qualification obviously helped as well and took them to a totally different stage, but looking really good for Tottenham. Nick, across North London, Arsenal making some waves and it looks like... Uh, Gabriel Jesus, they're working really hard to get him in. Rafinha as well from Leeds United. Looks like they've stolen the march on Barcelona and others. So what do you think about that? Because we, we thought Yuri Tielemans were coming. He hasn't come in yet, may still do. Um, obviously, Fabio Vieira coming in from Porto. That's all but confirmed. Some really good attacking signings, but these are the kind of players that Arsenal actually needed. I, I think Gabriel Jesus is perfect for them, especially with his connection with Mikel Arteta. Uh, but... Are they still maybe a bit too top heavy when you look at some of the attacking players they already have in Saka, Smith Rowe, Odegaard? I mean, what do we think here? Because they definitely needed that number nine. Uh, but I kind of question whether they needed Rafinha because they've got Martinelli, they've got other pieces there. But um, it, it's not bad. It looks like it's moving again in the right direction for Arsenal if they can get these moves over the line. Well, look, it's it's very interesting. Um, I, I think there's a lot of faith being shown in Arteta and I think he's earned a little bit of faith. I think they've cleaned up what 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 we really knew they needed to clean up, right? Like that, so many center back buys 
for a while and we wonder whether to develop and, you know, the, the sort of obsessive discussions over whether this is the time William Saliba actually gets to play for Arsenal. Look, Ben White is good. Aaron Ramsdale had a great season. Ben White, I don't even want to say he's good. I, I feel like it's over or understepping. He's very, very good. Uh, and he's he's formed a good partnership. I think we've seen when Tierney is healthy, although that's a, a loaded question, there were a lot of players that they were missing in defense last year or missed for a while because of injury. The Thielman's thing is a thing I, I thought they would have been made a little bit more of a priority on uh, yeah. because I, I think the attacking pieces are there. But the one thing I want to say, Martinelli, I like him and Smith Rowe, I like him. But if Arsenal's going to be Arsenal, it's not just, ooh, look at these guys who have arrived and they're kind of good. It's taking them and challenging them. So if if Smith Rowe, not that it's not like for like, but just make the comparison here if smith rowe is going to hold off um rafinha and still start what great news for arsenal but i <laughs> i think that when a young guy is good that's awesome but when you get a guy you can get a guy who's better that's even better so so if arsenal wants to be arsenal they've got to start to build back the depth that they used to have absolutely great point there defensively they were solidified last season that was the big improvement for them the reason why they nearly got into the top four but missing you know Abamyang leaving mid-season and not being himself. Lacazette then leaving in the summer. And Ketia signed a new deal, so that's good as a, a backup option. But if they can get someone of Gabriel Jesus' ilk in the door, I think he'd be absolutely perfect for this system. And uh, I think a perfect kind of fit as well with what Arteta is trying to do, right? Young, hungry players, talented, all as a group. And there's a really good balance there. Uh, Andy, we look across London to West London. Chelsea, some changes behind the scenes there with Bruce Buck, the longtime chairman. Stepping down, looks like Marina Granaskaya as well is going to move on. She's been the transfer guru at Chelsea for so many years under the former ownership. There's talk that Todd Bowley, the new American owner, is going to be doing a lot of the transfer deals here. Um, and we're looking around. Lukaku looks like he's going to back to Inter on loan. There's a lot of question marks about Timo Werner, Christian Pulisic, Hakem Ziyech maybe going out. And then the likes of Usman Dembele and Raheem Sterling coming in. So exciting for Chelsea, but a lot of change there and a little bit risky, but... Probably in that attacking third of the pitch, that's where the biggest changes need to be made uh, for Thomas Tuchel because everywhere else they're pretty solid, right? You say exciting for Ch I, I say I don't know. I really don't. Anytime you you kind of uh, obviously a transition of power running the club, but who is kind of more uh, directly operating the club in terms of the squad and the transfers and everything? Anytime that role, that job, that responsibility changes question everything that they do. Don't just say, okay, well, it's Chelsea. It's a big name player. It'll work out. You know, we give the benefit of the doubt, I think, in a lot of uh, stable situations, smart situations, situations where there's a track record of doing good business. And I think Chelsea have, uh, th there have been some big expensive misses over the years, but I think on the whole, they've been pretty good. And they, they, they've hit more uh, than they have missed. But with potentially the owner coming in and running the transfer business, uh, this could this could very quickly start to look like Manchester United of the last handful of years where it's just uh you know knee jerk reactions who's available this player's available i mean usman dembele uh since he's gone to barca uh, you know his value has just gone down every single year and if that's the type of player that we're talking about showing up at chelsea to you know build the new squad i, I just i just don't know that it's going to work out and chelsea's going to just just because they're Chelsea, maintain the level that they've been at, just because they have all that money, uh, as we've seen with Manchester United, it, it doesn't always matter. I just have I think, questions. I'm not saying it's not going to work. I have questions. Yeah. No, you would hope that there's some kind of legacy planning there, right, in terms of Afro yeah. Granovskaya, Petr Cech's behind the scenes. I'm, I'm sure there's someone there who is maybe going to take it in front of the owner and he's still involved in it, the new owner, but um, it's going to be interesting. I think defensively as well, losing Antonio Rudiger, yeah. Christensen's obviously gone as well. And then you have Thiago Silva, Azpilicueta, some very good centre-backs, but they really need to strengthen in that area as well. And the likes of N'Golo Kante, a mixed season last year of all his injuries. So yeah, I, get, I understand totally. A bit of a precarious situation for Chelsea to see you know, especially with Tottenham strengthening, Arsenal pushing them all the time, and maybe maybe Man United figuring things out. Uh, top four could be in the most jeopardy for them that it's been in a long, long time uh, this upcoming season. Um, all right, gents, a lot of transfer news there to wrap up over at ProSoccerTalk and NBCSports.com. We'll keep you updated with all the latest news across the summer. We've only just got started. Some big deals already, but so much more going on. We'll keep you updated daily on the site with everything going on in the Premier League and elsewhere in the soccer world.
KJ has to switch gears now and focus on the US men's national team. What did we learn from the recent friendlies and the Nations League games? And let's have a look at the strongest 11 now. If we were to pick today for the World Cup, there's, what, five months to go until everything kicks off in Qatar. Who would be starting for the US? First up, Nick Mandola. What do we learn from those friendlies against Morocco and Uruguay and the Nations League games? Is there any big takeaways there for you for Greg Bohart's side? Because there was a few for me, but you go ahead first. Yeah, listen, I think there will be plenty of time to dissect some problems with the team or some potential problem areas, but I do want to start with something positive. I I like the spirit. I I like what we've started. We started to see it maybe for the first time really blossom in that wild Nations League win over Mexico where it was clear that these guys were fighting for each other. We knew they had a a spirit within the squad. They've overcome some issues like um, whether they were as big in the team as they are in the media. Or, or, or with everybody else, like the Weston McKenney thing, which which really bothered me. Like, is why just play them, just play them, you know. But in these games, especially that last one, um, where they had every reason to just say, "Listen, we're going to beat El Salvador at home. We're going to beat Granada. We'll get out of this Nations League. Let's just not get hurt on this terrible, 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 terrible pitch and go home." And instead. You know, they got angry and they fought and they scrapped and they did not play like a team that was like when Bruce Arena um, down in Cuba and they're carrying players over puddles and making fun of the pitch and too big for it. They weren't too big for it. They were ready to fight. And that was really, really, really exciting for me. So I have a lot of questions. I'm I'm worried about how things may go uh, in Qatar. But in terms of whether or not Greg Berhalter is picking the best players or or putting them in the best position to succeed, he's got them believing in each other. And as a U.S. soccer fan, it is extremely refreshing. Yeah, I, I love that point uh, there, Nick, because it is not something that I've really thought about because we get so, as this generation has come through, we get so deep into the weeds on how they're playing, how each individual's used, what the overall tactics are, what the squad's going to be. And I think uh, I, at least personally, have kind of overlooked that part. But that is something that that when I think back to, uh, you know, the U.S. men's national teams of my earlier years, that was always the defining thing that existed. It was this team will outwork any team that they come up against. They will be far less talented. They will work just as hard and they will pull off some spectacular upsets sometimes. Sometimes they will get run off the field by supremely talented teams, but they always had that commitment. They always had the fight uh, for themselves, but for one another as well. And then I'm talking, you know, 2002, it's like 2000 and uh, even the 2014 team I, uh, yeah. at the World Cup, I think had a real aspect mm-hmm. of that because it was still the final days of Clint Dempsey and Jermaine Jones. And there were a number of players on that team uh, that I think really embodied that fighting spirit. And as the, obviously the 2018 World Cup debacle uh, that that, that happened, there's a lost generation in there between, eight years is a really long time. And when you go eight years between being in the World Cup, that's an entire almost international career for a lot of players. And so there is a veteran generation that doesn't really exist right now within the U.S. men's national team. And guys like John Brooks um, and, and Tim Ream when he's in there, uh, are the players that I think are kind of relied upon to bring that, you know, the experience is not the right word, but just the uh, the perspective, if you will, to this younger team and to see them. It, it is hard to remember that this, because we say it all the time, this is still a very young team. All of these individuals, they are aging at the exact same rate that we are. And, you know, they are very, very young at this point still. But the fact that they have that already, I think, is so promising uh, coming from them, but also coming from Burhalter as well, because he has fostered that over a long period of time. And I know we question, well, why is Weston McKinney not on the team? Why are we not even calling Weston McKinney up? Why are we calling up this player instead of this player? But there's always you can always point to something and say, well, I think I understand what he's trying to do there. And I think that uh, the the team building, the the belief building, the mentality building aspect of being the head coach of the national team, I think he's taken that very serious. And I think he's gotten a lot of it right. And that has them, I think, uh, feeling the confidence that they do now four or five months before the World Cup. That's a great point because they're clearly going to be one of the youngest if not the youngest team at the World Cup um, on average start and age, which is going to be an incredible experience, not just for this team now, but in four years after that and the mm-hmm. 2026 World Cup as well. That's going to hold them in very good stead for that tournament. Okay, so mentality is looking great. What about tactically on the pitch then? Are the biggest issue still the same issues we've mm-hmm. had for, what, six to 12 months now? I'm 
thinking centre back, it's basically Walker Zimmerman's in, and then if Miles Robinson is healthy, him he's in, or Aaron Long, Carter Vickers got some good minutes in this one and just signed with with Celtic a long term deal, and then up front as well, right? Hadji Wright come in, Phil Harter had some interesting comments about him not potentially taking his opportunity, which I thought was a little bit harsh. <laughs> um, and it's still no one's really stepping up in those two positions, right, Nick? I mean, is there anybody else? You'd want to try in these last two games in September before the World Cup. Do you think Carter Vickers deserves more minutes? Anybody else up top? Because time's running out, and those are two pretty big areas for the US to figure it out uh, with just, yeah, 180 minutes to go until they kick off of the World Cup. Yeah, I'd like to sit down with Greg Berhalter, and I, I wish I could and just kind of have a have a pop with him and, and have these discussions about well, what's the plan now? Is it still possession right is it still because when you talk about making these decisions about who's next to Zimmerman who has become a much better passer over his years is are we valuing possession because then I don't understand why Aaron Long is out there and it makes me rethink whether Matt Turner or Zach Steffen plays because Matt Turner I, is a superior shot stopper but Steffen is better with his feet so I just kind of want to know um, what's not, what's the plan here? Cause I don't want to make it sound like they're disorganized, but it seemed like as he adapted spirit wise, as he's adapted chemistry wise, this is where all my questions are. Cause the best passer on the team at center back is still in the pool is still John Brooks. Um, yeah. Given his age and where he is as a center back, I understand if maybe you don't want them, but then are you telling me that the plan is different now when we have the ball, what we're trying to do when we build with it, because we have Tyler Adams, is he dropping between the backs instead of coming from off to the right, which was the initial plan. And I wonder in his heart of hearts, if he has had to make some sacrifices and he wants to keep playing to the, to what he talked about, because what he preached is the future of us soccer. We have more technical players coming in and growing and all that, but has he had to kind of adapt and in his head, he goes, yeah, I'm going to keep talking about these things. But we're going to get pragmatic and we're going to be gritty and we're going to, you know, Aaron Long is going to kick the living crap out of Harry Kane. That's how we're going to try and win. Maybe that's the plan now. Maybe that is the plan. And maybe that feeds into the point you very you made at the very start of this in terms of the mentality, the, the chippiness, mm -hmm. the edginess, the fact they're scrapping away. And then they can maybe not to disrespect some of the other, the former U.S. teams, but I'd argue this is the most talented technically that the U.S. has ever had, especially in the final third of the pitch. So then they can win the battle and learn how to do that side of things. Technically, then Bo Harter's ideas and philosophy kick in in midfield in the final third. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting. Let, maybe we can grab a grab a, a beer with Greg and get him on the show one time. Who knows? Um, so this is our chance of being Greg Bo Harter, though. Let's try and agree on a U.S. men's national team start in 11. Is it set in stone five months until the World Cup final? So... Let's let's do it between us. We're all on the screen here. We can all agree. We can all everyone can see our agreeance or disagreeance based on our facial expressions. But are we all going for Matt Toner and goal? Let's start in goal, or are we going for Zach Steffen? Zach oh Steffen. wow! I was watching. I'm Andy going Steffen. Steffen. Listen, I, and as you were talking there, Nick, about are, are we doing possession still or, or are we not doing possession still? Uh, Luca De La Torre being like oh, yeah. almost oh, a good. permanent fixture now, I think is a very clear indicator. We're still doing possession. And I think the interchangeability of like him and, and Jean-Luc Abusio at times and Kellen Acosta at times as well uh, is Berhalter has a type uh, for that position. And I think he's found it. And so I think we are still doing possession. So it's got to be Stefan for me. I'll go with that. I, I I have been thinking it's going to be Matt Turner, um, but I want what Andy says to be right. So I'm gonna, I'm going to go with Zach Stefan too. Okay, let's go with Stefan. I think he has slightly more experience, but I think it would be harsh on Turner. And I think the difficulty with those two goalkeepers is that neither is probably going to play that much between now and the World Cup. If they uh, Turner's going to be the backup at Arsenal, uh, it seems like, and then Stefan. I don't see Man City really letting him leave on loan. So those guys are going to be relying on League Cup appearances and maybe in Turner's case, playing in the Europa League. Um, so that's a bit worrying for the US that those goalkeepers might be rusty. But I honestly do think it's a flip of a coin. But if we're going with possession, let's agree on Stefan. Okay, back four. Left back, Anthony Robinson. We all agree on that if he's fit. Walker Zimmerman, one of the centre-backs. I mean, Robinson, the other centre back, if fit, I mean, is he going to make it? I'm, I'm not sure. That's that's uh, just question mark, right? Just saw a video of him putting weight on his foot for the first time, and I couldn't remember. I, I was trying to. Be, I'm not a doctor, you know. Like, is this good or bad? Is this is this earlier or later? 
I'll tell you what, I, 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 are we agreeing? And Andy mentioned his name, and I know I'm usually the one who's, are we agreeing to not mention John Brooks? Because I do think he's still the best <laughs> choice. And he could he's going to sign somewhere and yeah. potentially be playing every minute. And that's what that's what Burhalter's kind of left it leaning on. I just I think he's the best for the job, but I'm not I wouldn't pick him right now because I want to be realistic. It's it's wide open, Andy. Go. I mean, I could say Carter Vickers, Chris Richards, if one of those guys yeah. takes chances and is injury free at the start of the season and playing well, then I could easily see one of those guys taking the spot. But Andy, go ahead. Yeah, I I, I think that in an ideal world, it's Chris Richards. Uh, if he can stay healthy and because the possession uh, being on the ball, he is much more mobile than John Brooks. And so I think perfect world, but he's proven that he can't stay healthy at this point. I think realistically right now, um, and given the, especially as you get into the knockouts, I think the way that you're, they're going to try to play will change. And I do think you go for more of an Aaron long type alongside Walker Zimmerman, because you understand what it's going to be. You're going to have less of the sustained possession, uh, that you want to try to have against the likes of a Brazil or a Germany and Argentina teams of that ilk. Um, and so I think it, it ultimately <laughs> ends up kind of the, the Matt Beasler, John Brooks slash Jeff Cameron, uh, you know, trio that, that rotated in 2014. And also on, on Miles Robinson, I'm not doing the, is he going to make it in time for the World Cup? Th I remember Charlie Davies in 2010 and how everybody got their hopes up. Oh, it's Davies will be back before the World Cup. And Charlie Davies was not back for years until after that. So let's just, let's not even start that one right now. Okay. Um, so Gino Des right back. I think he's got it locked down there. Mm -hmm. uh, midfield three is pretty easy, I think. Tyler Adams, Weston mm -hmm. McKenney, and Eunice Musa uh, mm -hmm. is that three. Well, didn't, that was easy. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, up front is difficult, but let's go with the wide players. We're playing a 4 3 3. Um, Pulisic on the left, Tim Weyer on the right. Mm -hmm. And then who's playing up front? That's the big problem, right? Nick? Yeah. yeah. I have a really, really challenging time with this because I look at the guys who aren't being called in and they miss a big chance in World Cup qualifying. And now during these friendlies, is, is Jesus Ferreira getting all of these chances to shine because he's in form or because they really, really want him to take it? I honestly believe that if you were to go on body of work over the past few years, um, that I, I want to see PFOC get another chance. I really do. What he's done at Young Boys, what he does in the Champions League, but his misses in qualifying were just so glaring. And the harsh judgment on Haji Wright uh, from Greg Berhalter, while, again, I think it wasn't as harsh. I think some lines might have been left out of some of the transcriptions. He was just kind of saying, I expected a little bit more from him today. Um, I really do think they want Ferreira or Pepe to take it. And mm. it looks like right now that Ferreira is going to get that chance. So let's hope he gets a lot more savvy or else he's going to be a 22, 23 year old kid. I, I forget how old he is trying to make it work as the number nine for the United States men's national team in a world cup against England. Andy, um, before you jump in, there's a lot of clamoring for Tim Weyer to start as a number yeah, nine. I like that too. It's, I, I feel like he's better on the right though. Some great deliveries and just seems a lot more natural out there. I don't think he's really a natural finisher. I'm just going to say my piece. I would start one of Christian Pulisic or Giovanni Reina in a false nine and have them. I just think you have to somehow get your best attacking players on the pitch. And I don't know how Gio, Pulisic and Weyer, I just don't know how it fits because the midfield three for me is set in stone. That is the, the heartbeat of this U.S. team. So Think about your wild card too, Joe. Your wild card is Brendan Aronson, who is yeah. going to be <laughs> on our TV screens, I think, quite a bit this year. Yeah, and maybe... And he he takes what Eunice Musa's spot maybe as a more attack minded central. Oh, I don't think Musa's yeah. coming off the pitch. Yeah. Well, exactly. I've, I've, yeah. I've got Aaron, Aronson way above Reina right now for the fact that he plays, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's important, um, and that he can be available. I, uh, it's interesting that, that you're going the no striker route, Joe, because I've kind of been making this argument on on PST for about a month now or so. Anytime that, that we're talking national team, whether it's game coverage or preview or or just roster talk. It's not there. The player is not there in the pool. There, there is not a player in the U.S. men's national team player pool that's going to do the job that the national team wants right now. And so I think trying to throw somebody out there to do that job is, you know, it's it's insanity. You're, you're trying the same thing over and over and you're getting the same result. I think Ricardo Pepe has about two months at the start of the season to come out rested and recovered and just 
acclimated to life in Germany. That's tough to do in January, go in the middle of, of the season, arrive into a new team that's fighting relegation, all those factors. He's got two months, I think, to come out and show marketed improvement um, in being at Augsburg. And if it's not going to be him, I think it's probably Ferreira. I don't think that Berhalter goes full, no center forward. I think he's the closest thing to it, though, because he is such a number 10 playing in the number nine role. He's not really looking to score as much as he's looking to drop in and play make, which I think is great with Wea Pulisic making runs off. Uh, I think you could make a case that that uh, Reina, Aronson, Wea Pulisic, uh, all four of those could really kind of play you know, for periods of a game fluidly off of one another and, and create something maybe, you know, at least interesting. And I think uh, cause some problems for the opposition, at least. Yeah, it, it's difficult. It's it's such a key area, right? But I just feel like for the U.S., they have to get all of those talented players. I mean, Aronson, Reina, Pulisic, Weyer on the pitch pretty much at the same time to to cause problems. And I just don't, there's no natural number nine. And there hasn't been for a long time. A lot of guys have been tried, and I think we saw recently Bill is frustrated by the lack of options or the, the players who haven't been getting minutes with their club teams have made the big move to Europe, like Pepe, and, and that's impacted the US, right? So that centre-back and the forward options are the big issues. Everywhere else, I think they're pretty set defensively in the midfield, looking pretty good. So I'm glad we agreed on most of that starting 11, and I'm sure everybody's going to agree in the comments below. So looking forward to seeing those lineups. Uh, but remember, on Pro Soccer Talk and EmbassySports.com, we'll keep you updated with all the latest U.S. news ahead of the World Cup, building up towards those friendlies, and we'll be focusing on how the U.S. players are doing uh, for their club teams. Nick does a wonderful job with the uh, ranking of the player pool and seeing who's hot, who's not. I feel like there's still a bit of change, maybe, and fingers crossed, no more injuries for these key U.S. players between now and November when the tournament starts. Okay, gents, let's now focus on... Uh, on a fun topic, the 2026 World Cup host cities have been selected. 11 host cities have been selected in the U.S. for the tournament being held in Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. in, what, four years' time? So the countdown's already on, even though we've got another World Cup before that. Uh, 11 cities in the U.S. We thought there was going to be 10, but they took Edmonton out of Canada, which is a bit of a surprise, and then added an extra U.S. city. I mean, Nick, what was your initial reaction to some of those cities uh, that got hosting bids because there, there was one big surprise right washington dc slash baltimore even though the stadium bid wasn't that strong we all kind of expected there to be uh the, the host uh country to have a stadium in the capital city and i know our wonderful producer humberto who, who hails from that region is pretty much devastated that there aren't going to be any world cup games in that area but was that the big surprise any others for you or anything that really stuck out from the 11 u.s cities that were selected uh, it was a surprise, and it's not that type of show, so I'll be very quick with it. It made me realize that um, our current uh, political state is is probably playing into that a little bit. Maybe there's a little bit of a fear of being around, you know, the capital and that sort of stuff. And hopefully, we'll have a better situation by 2026. But I think that you know that it, it shows you that you know the country is in a place right now that we all know it's in. Um, my thing when I always look at this stuff is usually food. <laughs> I know that sounds terrible, <laughs> but the first thing I think about is I'm going to go to a game and I'm going to, I remember the, the the last time I was in, in Houston choosing where to eat because of all the delightful uh, Mexican restaurants was just so much, it was great. And, and I think about, you know, not people around the world are maybe thinking, oh, I want to go get a New York slice, as they say, or they're looking. So my first thing is always food. Um, but then I just think about the, where we've grown, um, Atlanta stadium. Dallas's stadium, these places are going to be, they're just going to catch everybody's eyes. 100%. And the United States, this is where we get a chance to showcase ourselves um, in, in the good way. And these venues are almost all going to pop off the screen. And, you know, I, I think it's going to be really cool. It's nice to just kind of say, hey, remember, we got stuff here. Yeah, it's incredible, right? I mean, you think 32 years after the 94 World Cup, it's an entire generation on now to see how much the game has even come on in the last 10 to 15 years. But since that World Cup, when there wasn't even MLS, soccer-specific stadiums were an alien kind of uh, a thing. So let's just recap which cities actually made it. Atlanta, Boston, Dallas, Houston, Kansas City, LA, Miami, New York City slash New Jersey. Uh, Philadelphia, San Francisco, and Seattle. So, Andy, you live in one of those cities, Kansas City, and that was right on the bubble and was maybe a surprise for some people. But tell us about the experience there because 
many people who have followed MLS closely have seen the rise of sport in KC and the rise of Kansas City as a soccer hub. This probably wasn't as big of a surprise as to outsiders, right? So people must be really excited there. Yeah, you you say surprise. I I think people in Kansas City know uh, the soccer culture that exists here. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's been tested. It's proven itself now for a decade, uh, going on and, and, you know, not even 15 years ago, the sport of soccer almost left Kansas city with the wizards then, uh, nearly moving to Rochester, New York. And at that point, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, a world cup host city 15, 14 years in, into the future, not even having a team. None of those things happen if not for, you know, sporting Kansas city rebranding and building their stadium. And so this is like, this was the culmination of a lot of things that have been happening uh, for quite a long time in Kansas city. I think it's hugely deserved for the city as well, because uh, you know, people will come to Kansas city and they will, they will leave with the impression of, wow, I can't believe I had that much fun there. It is one of those type of places um, that that you give it a chance, you give it an opportunity and and it really does sell itself to you. So I I was, I was happy to see it on, on from the, from the perspective of, you know, having the world cup in the city that I was born in and had lived my entire life in will be a really cool experience. Um, and, and the fact that we get to do that, uh, you know, over some other deserving cities as well, uh, is, you know, it's, it's a pretty special thing because the world cup, you know, it's, it doesn't come around every single year. It'll have been what, uh, tw- uh 32 years since the last time that it was in the U S by the time that we have it. Uh, that's a really, really long time. Um, and by the next time it comes around, doing quick math here, I'll be almost 70. So I probably won't enjoy it in quite the same way. So I'm really going to enjoy uh, the opportunity to have the World Cup here in my city for sure. That's a great point because it's wherever these games are going to be played, right? It's transformational. It's going to be a huge party, huge, uh, I, I think, moment for, for U.S. soccer and, and the sport in the country. We said that in 94. I, I think now even more so is how the game's going to get to the next level and become even more popular than it already is. So uh, some of those bigger picture things there, uh, are going to be forefront, but you said it. There's so many cities that are deserving of of being hosts, and just to mention the cities that didn't make it in terms of Denver, Nashville, Orlando, Cincinnati, Washington D.C. slash Baltimore. Those cities were all deserving in terms of being host cities as well. But if you only have 11, and uh, yeah, it, for me, the most interesting thing about this World Cup is. I wrote someone on Pro Soccer Talk and NBCSports.com about this. Is it's the first ever 48 team World Cup. We know that. So the group stage is going to be very different. There's going to be two group stage games per group. It's going to be 16 groups of three teams in each. So it's almost, when you look at the map of where the cities are, there's regional pods, essentially, that FIFA has set up. So Seattle and Vancouver, you'd think a couple of groups will be based there for the group stages and maybe the early knockout rounds. The same with San Francisco and LA. The same with Atlanta and Miami. And again, I know some of these cities are quite large distances, uh, but I think it gives a really good opportunity for fans, you know, from England or from Colombia, from wherever. If they go to a certain region of the States, play one game on a Thursday in San Francisco and then travel down the coast to L.A. for the next group game on a Sunday, they can experience so much. And it'll be such a great atmosphere traveling between those regions. That's They're going to have to do that. Otherwise, there's going to be huge amounts of travel cross country from you know, not going to have group games, I don't think, in Miami of one one day and then in Seattle for a few days later. That's not going to happen. Um, so it was really interesting to me to kind of think about how it's going to work regionally. I think that played into a lot about host cities as well uh, and why mm. certain cities were selected, especially in the Northeast with Philadelphia, Boston and New York City and, and Toronto as well. The kind of those areas up there, I think it's really easy to travel in between those cities and there's huge, huge population levels there as well. So it, it, it does make sense when you look at why FIFA has selected some of these venues. And I'm so excited. I'm so excited. But let, let's have a go at what Nick mentioned earlier. Let's focus on food, uh, <laughs> infrastructure. Let's focus on nightlife uh, and all that kind of stuff. The weather, the stadium. And let's rank these cities um, 11 to 1. Let, let's, let's have a go at doing it. I, I did this and I got absolutely hammered for some of my selections. Um, but... I think there's probably six or seven cities, right, that are, are sort of the front runners in terms of they definitely had to have World Cup games. And then the rest are kind of interchangeable. But Nick, is there any that really stand out to you? Because I had New York, New Jersey as number one, and I think it's the front runner to host the World Cup final as well. Do, do you agree with that being right at the top of the list as a as a venue? 
I mean, it could be a great thing, I guess. I'm I'm biased. Listen, as as uh, someone who lives in the only city in New York State that has a National Football League team, it's really kind of tricky <laughs> to to rate New York that high. No, listen, I, I think my number one. Um, it, I know it sounds goofy, but after watching all these all our coverage of you know Super Bowl and all that, I do think that LA has a certain allure. When you talk about packing, packing a punch and a venue and mm-hmm. Hollywood and all that, so I'm gonna put that as number one. Also, I've never been there, so I kind of want to check it out. But I'll put LA over New York, and it has a World Cup memory as well, right? But I do think most people would be with you in New York. I'm the wrong guy to ask this too, and I think Andy might be a little bit like me. I like the upstarts. I want to go to Seattle. I want to go to KC. Um, I like the smaller places. Yeah, I think I'm pretty lucky. I think I've actually been to nine of these 11 cities that have been selected. So I kind of have a, a an understanding of, and I think there's some really, really good ones. Kansas City, I love spending time. There. Andy and I talk about this all the time. It's a really, really good, um, I think, outlier for people. It wouldn't be maybe the first place they'd say on the list of cities here. Oh, I'd really want to go to a game there. But I think people will walk away. Probably like Philadelphia as well, being really surprised about the culture, how it's something uniquely different than than some of these almost world cities, right? New York, LA, these places could, it, you could be in London, you could be in Paris, obviously there's slight differences, but these mega cities um, are always gonna be great. But I think the real, the, the great thing about this World Cup is Seattle, Kansas City, Houston, Philadelphia, these kind of places are gonna get to showcase uh, how great they are as cities on their own, but as soccer markets as well. But Andy, is there anywhere that really stands out to you as the number one city? Because the only reservation I have about LA being the the final host is because they had it in 94 and i think maybe they'll spread it out to to new york and have it on the east coast but then you you factor in the weather right you know you're pretty much guaranteed good weather in la compared to new york new jersey that time of the year might may be difficult with storms and stuff i I don't know i'm just chucking it out yeah here's one thing that i've not seen people talk about the world cup in the u.s and mexico has the potential for the weather and to be just as effective on the tournament itself as say Qatar this yeah. year. Uh, I mean, it, you go outside right now in Kansas city, it is oppressively hot and yeah. humid. it is disgusting out there right now. So I think that's something to factor in. And speaking of, of, of hot and humid, I would not be shocked if the final ends up in Miami for the simple fact that all of the, all of the execs at FIFA, Where do they want to hang out? And if they can get an extra few days in Miami because it's work and they have to be there, I think they might take that opportunity. And and it's obviously a very global city. And and there is just such a melding of different people that that, that exist there. Uh, It would be a unique uh, location for for something like that. So I wouldn't be shocked if that happened. But I think probably it leans towards New York. Yeah, would be the would be the one that uh, I think those are one, two in my mind. Yeah, um, that's a really good point. And it, let's not forget Philadelphia. It's going to be the 250th anniversary of the U.S. during this World Cup, July 4th. Mm-hmm. There might be some la- latter stages of the World Cup games. Imagine if the U.S. plays England there. I'm just throwing that out uh, around that time. That would be pretty cool in a World Cup quarterfinal or something. But so many great things. Um, I've got my full ranking up on Pro Soccer Talk on NBCSports.com. I think we all agree these 11 cities are going to be amazing. It's going to be a festival of soccer. It's, it's, you know, four years away, but I cannot wait for this. And hopefully all three of us will be going to plenty of games that summer across the country. And that will be a really exciting time for everybody. But yeah, just a really cool time because it's taken a long time. There's been delays along the way to pick these host cities. So I think it was a relief for a lot of these cities to find out they finally have the World Cup and now they can start making all the plans for before, during, and most importantly, after the legacy this leaves for young players and generations to come who maybe have never watched a soccer game, but will go to a game in Kansas City or Boston or Philly and then fall in love with the game like we all have. And I think that's the greatest thing about this tournament and what I hope it really brings uh, to the US, Mexico and Canada in 2026. So gents, this has been great. I feel like we talked about weather a lot on this show. We kind of gone full circle as well. Um, So we'll be up with your latest update on the on the hour no i'm joking um thanks so much for joining me as always uh pleasure thanks everyone for watching pro soccer talk and we'll speak to you all very soon indeed cheers guys 
Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch highlights all season long and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend at 7 a.m. Eastern. And for even more content, head over to Peacock, where we've got live games, original series and a dedicated round-the-clock Premier League channel featuring studio shows, classic matches and much more.